Mary Redmond, uh, I'm glad she uh, will guide you through this uh, easy talk with Jeffrey Snub, uh, a very special event, so the last event of our Venice Center for Digital and Public Humanities at Kafoska University this year. It has been a very eventful year, a very exciting year, but also very exhausting, exhausting year, so a lot of uh, so we talked already about the fatigue of, uh, of presence uh, in front of screen, but uh, I'm very glad that this event is with, with Jeffrey today and we, uh, there are high expectations and we saw already uh, a lot from your uh, last presentation uh, as part of the series organized by Humanities for Change, who I really want to thank for organizing uh, uh, the, the series and also to be involved in today's event. So. Uh, um, you, you brought Jeffrey here, and uh, we are very thankful for this, especially Marco Zato made all the, the com communication, but the whole team, so it's a really fascinating job that, that you did. Uh, very welcome all the guests today from, from wherever you, you come from. Uh, thank you to my team or our team uh, at, at the center, at the Departimento, uh, for preparing this event and so many other events, so it really was uh, a full year under very special conditions. Uh, thank you uh, to, to the students. I hope uh, there are as many as possible. I see some names of our students, so the first generation of uh, students of our master program, Digital and Public uh, Humanities. So um, uh, thank you for your patience because uh, not everything is working the way it should be working. So, and uh, uh, things are complicated and under these conditions even more complicated, but I hope you get as much as possible and uh, you made the right choice to come today to this event. Uh, um, and to not learn or prepare your exams for tomorrow because uh, they are right now in the phase of, of uh, exams. So I'm sorry for this bad timing, but uh, that's... <laughs> um, yeah, so um, thank you, uh, Jeffrey, for, for coming. So just the, the last anecdote, so recently also on Twitter, there was a, a question of a friend. So is there any celebrity or a, a prominent figure uh, in digital humanities that uh, has an impact also beyond our, our bubble. And uh, spontaneously into my mind came uh, um, uh, uh, Edward van Houten, the, the editor of uh, digital, uh, digital Scholarship in the Humanities, uh, because he has a gin bar in Bruges. So uh, <laughs> the other one was Franco Moretti, but mostly because of his brother, <laughs> Nani. And, and, and you, because I mean, you really do such an impressive work and so many initiatives and projects and your advent was already so inspiring, uh, so you don't even have to appear. So we had a lot of discussions already just looking at, at the things that you are doing. And yeah, so thank you very much. And I hand over now to Mary, who uh, gratefully uh, does the moderation and is very close to, to things you are doing and uh, has a, a very broad overview about what is useful for us and everyone here interested in humanities. Thank you. Thank you, Franz. Thank, thank you, Franz. Just a brief introduction because we're recording. Um, so Jeffrey Schnapp is currently the Professor of Romance Languages and Literatures in Harvard with, uh, uh, with an appointment also in the School of Architecture and an association to critical media in Harvard. So he is an academic. He came from Stanford. He came to Harvard in 2011, where um, he, he, was, he also had set up some digital humanity projects. But um, he's also the CEO, our visionary CEO, which is a great title to have, of Piaggio First, which is something he set up in 2018. So um, looking at the eclectic and absolutely wonderful uh, work that you've done, Jeffrey, um, I see I could describe you as many things as a cult cultural historian. I could say you were an absolute expert in knowledge design because looking at the breadth of the projects you've done, it's absolutely fascinating. And what I think is also so impressive that you are concurrently an active entrepreneur, not just an entrepreneur, an active entrepreneur. And I want to ask you more about that. Um, but also I would like to describe you as an innovator, a cultural innovator, and uh, also a public humanist. So with those small titles to your name, <laughs> <laughs> um, I look forward to your lecture and we'll come back to you with some questions when you finish talking and most you're most welcome. Thank you. Yes, thank you to both of you for uh, that kind introduction and uh, just by way of, uh, you know, starting out this conversation with and I do very much hope it will be a conversation. Um, uh, I, I'll, I guess what I'd like to say is a little bit about um, the trajectory that I've followed in my own work 
towards public humanities, towards digital humanities, towards exploring these forms of practice between um, uh, the academy, the world of museums, uh, the world of libraries and archives, um, and maybe just to say a few things about uh, how maybe what might appear like activities that don't have a direct through line between them, how they actually interconnect. Uh, not because any of this was planned in my case, but rather because projects and commitments and passions have a way of leading you to make certain kinds of choices to follow certain pathways that then in the long run uh, reconnect even if there was no intentional path that led to those points of interconnection. And so uh, I, my career uh, began, uh, I, I always had a strong interest in two domains, really the Middle Ages, High Middle Ages, 13th, 14th century, and the uh, sort of first half of the 20th century, particularly the avant-garde. Uh, and um, because of teachers, because of various commitments in the course of my graduate uh, studies, I ended up working as a medievalist, principally as a scholar of, uh, particularly with a focus on romance literatures, but Italian literature in particular. Um, and one of the things about being a medievalist is that uh, it's a wonderful and extraordinarily rich field, but it's a very lonely existence. <laughs> um, typically, your areas of of expertise of deep knowledge uh, put you in a conversation that's a conversation with a very small circle of, of people. Uh, and often as you become more and more um, um, uh, sort of, as your career matures and as your work is published and as you, that career path progresses, that circle can actually get even smaller in the sense that you come to know who it is that you respect, who, you, who it is that you're writing for. And um, it, even in a field that has a deep and long history like Dante studies, for example, uh, you become acutely aware of the fact that in a sense, you're not writing for hundreds or even thousands of people, but you're often writing for two or three people <laughs> who uh, you really think of as your peers. Mm -hmm. And that's a wonderful and privileged position to be in, in many ways, but it's also a very lonely position. And I, I think uh, in the course of, uh, when I first went to Stanford in the uh, early 1980s, having practiced as a visual artist for a number of years, having had some interests in computation and finding myself surrounded by the kind of excitement, the ferment that was happening in the Silicon Valley in the whole San Francisco Bay Area, in the 1980s and 1990s, as we were beginning to see not only the, the first kind of bubbling up of internet culture, but also a whole series of cultural communities that were excited by the opportunities of, uh, in a sense, be becoming uh, players in this uh, new and emerging reality. Uh, I, I, and particularly being at Stanford, of course, which is a university that was played a central role alongside the University of California at Berkeley in that transformation of the emergence of this innovation economy, really felt uh, the disjunction between my, my reality as a, an Italian cultural historian and this, uh, this set of opportunities and conversations that were happening all around me. And by the time the 90s came along, uh, my impatience grew into a fantasy, uh, which I was lucky enough to be able to realize by the end of the 1990s, was to, which was to build a platform between the different domains of the humanities that uh, some of this surrounding uh, um, revolution were, was beginning to, where, where points of intersection were beginning to emerge and that larger world of the innovation economy that was rising up. And uh, by the end of the 1990s, that, um, uh, that dream became the Stanford Humanities Lab, which was the lab that I established and that lasted for 10 years mm -hmm. through 2009, which is when I actually left, Harvard, left Stanford to go to Harvard. Meta Lab came along in 2011. 
Uh, but in the course of uh, that process, uh, the Humanities Lab was born not with a clear vocation to practice public history, for example, or civic humanities, public humanities. But uh, I think what's interesting in that story is that the civic, the public became part of the conversation almost immediately. <laughs> um, and almost immediately as the humanities lab launched in 1999 at Stanford, a bunch of themes emerged that have completely reshaped my own career trajectory and my priorities and, and the, 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 um, the, the subsequent choices I've made. Um, one of them was to think about scale, about the scale on which we carry out work in the humanities um, and arts disciplines. I was trained to be a medievalist. Uh, typically to be a medievalist, it's hard. You have to really have, you can't be a medievalist who deals, uh, very few people have the erudition, the skill set, the knowledge base to cover everything from late antiquity all the way into the Renaissance. Uh, there's too many domains of expertise that require too much specialized knowledge to cover that entire territory. So you focus in, you, you, you dig deep, you drill deep into a certain domain, in my case, the 14th century, um, and you focus in on that. And of course, that is uh, the, the environment in which you become a knowledge creator. Uh, but in the course of doing that, of course, uh, uh, the scale of the kinds of knowledge forms that you can give rise to become, becomes increasingly narrow and small as well. Uh, and when, we, when you shift out of these traditional domains of specialization of disciplinary based knowledge into a space of experimentation, like the space of experimentation that the Stanford, Stanford Humanities Lab wanted to inaugurate, you start to rethink that question of scale, particularly as you start to engage with digital resources, with the kinds of database resources that have become one of the defining features of the landscape of knowledge production in our own era. And you face not only challenges which have to do with that shift in scale from the very small and specialized and focused to potentially the very large, uh, but it, and that shift is not only a question of scale in terms of the kind of cognitive sense, but it's also a it poses a whole series of new challenges which have to do with what an argument is, what forms of evidence are, how you marshal the powers of a database to tell a story, uh, how you check that story, how the design decisions that have been made in terms of architecting that those knowledge forms have already included and excluded. All of that work suddenly becomes part of the process of designing a research question. Uh, coming up with uh, methodology to address that. And then addressing what is the next set of challenges, which is what is communicating that knowledge form look like when you're operating in this new expanded universe. This is no longer a print-based universe, uh, but rather a universe where you're interacting with forms of media, with databases, with analytical and other kinds of tools. Uh, suddenly you've moved out into a, a world where the asking of research questions is also the asking of a series of design questions. And also the asking of a series of audience questions. Who am I creating this form of knowledge for? What form does it assume? What platforms does it travel on? What peer structures are used to evaluate the, its value or uh, its limits? Um, and so in my own trajectory in the humanities lab was the first expression of this, the shift towards from individual scholarship as a specialist, a domain expert in a domain to working in a laboratory setting where the, the laboratory was a space of collaborative work involving uh, tools and techniques and technologies and media that were not part of the core set of assets that I was originally trained to work with, uh, really just transformed almost every aspect of what I did. And within all of that was the question of who is this knowledge for? How does it express itself? Is it, does it circulate in 
narrow communities of expertise or does it speak to audiences outside those communities as well as perhaps the communities of expertise? And how do we build bridges between those domains? Um, so for me, the word, a key part of that trajectory has to do with the word laboratory. Um, when the humanities lab was first under discussion at Stanford in the 1990s, uh, it was in 1998 to be precise, <laughs> Uh, there was a, there were actually three colleagues uh, who were deep, true believers in this idea of making the step to build bridges between what was happening around us and what was happening in our different humanities and arts fields. Uh, one of them is an archaeologist, uh, one of them is a historian of science, um, and the other uh, is was a, a literary historian. Um, and one of the first things that we spent a lot of time debating was what should we call this thing we're trying to create? <laughs> you know, is it a center? No, oh, center sounds like a form that we've already seen before. Uh, is, it, uh, uh, is it a research group? That seemed like a weak way to describe what we were trying to do. We're trying to build an institutional platform that would build bridges between these different areas of the university. Um, and the word laboratory came up uh, early in the discussion, and uh, it was the one that I championed and I eventually prevailed on. For me, the word laboratory was important for two reasons. One, it immediately raises a question which in the arts and humanities, uh, I think is a question of urgency even today, which is collaboration. Is the individualized kind of artisanal model of scholarship that I was describing that I was trained to perform myself, that most of us were trained to perform, is it adequate to the complexity and the challenges and the opportunities, especially, of knowledge creation that we have today? The second, and certainly collaboration, which is essential to the natural science concept of the laboratory, the idea that not everybody does everything, but rather we have a hierarchical structure with people with different fields of expertise, different domains of practice. They all work together towards forms of knowledge creation um, that builds on the different forms of expertise, a bigger picture. Uh, for me, that was important as a model, not necessarily to, <clears throat> to just borrow what people do in a chemistry laboratory or in a bioscience laboratory, but to use that model and bring it and adapt it to the specific opportunities and, and challenges that the arts and humanities fields pose. The second meaning of the word laboratory that appealed to me particularly is the notion of labor, <laughs> labor, the idea that laboratories are places where we perform research, but where we get our hands dirty. In other words, where we don't observe this kind of in my view, it's a false distinction between the theoretical and the applied. Uh, and I think we've moved into a world where that distinction has ever less meaning than it, if it ever had meaning, uh, I think it had meaning about 50 years ago. I think increasingly the theoretical and the applied, the pure and the practice based really uh, have converged in all kinds of modes, areas of knowledge production, uh, and cultural uh, production in new ways under digital conditions. And I think for me, the idea of the laboratory was important also to break down that notion that somehow there's a separation between these forms of pure research, theoretical inquiry and the dom domains, all that world of domains of the applied, whether it's physical making, it's artisanal practice, it's um, it's uh, the creation of stuff that lives out in the world that goes out and travels. Um, and maybe the last uh, meaning of the word laboratory that was important in this process, this passage, was uh, the, uh, the notion, uh, not just of labor, of work, of like even hands-on work, but also thinking about those places of knowledge production that were part of the whole history of particularly Western culture, which is the culture, cultural history tradition that I know best, like the medieval scriptorium, they were never places where monks were, you know, just practicing transcription of manuscripts. They were always places where science, where the boundary line between 
the human sciences and the, what we now call social sciences or natural sciences was a permeable boundary. And where we didn't just say, we do this and other people do that, where it was the research questions that we ask that led us to the disciplinary domains, uh, irrespective of the kinds of taxonomies that we inherited from the uni German universities of the late 19th century. Uh, so you'll notice in the case of the Stanford Humanities Laboratory, we still had the word humanities in the, the title of the uh, of the, the, the lab, but in the case of Metalab, we don't even have humanities. You also know, notice we don't have the word digital because in neither case is the digital the protagonist of the kinds of research questions that we do. However much we believe that computational techniques and digital media and the whole world of information technologies is central to the way we produce knowledge, the way we produce culture for that matter, the way we communicate. So I, uh, I say this only to suggest that the revolution we're talking about, that for me, the word laboratory was hinting at that completely transformed my own practice was never totally digital centric. However central the digital was to what we were doing because it implies consequences in the analog practices that we're engaged in just as much. And often the research questions that we ask may come from a completely different domain. They're not driven by the technology. The technology is there to facilitate, to enable the asking of certain kinds of questions, the contemplation, the construction of certain answers and propositions, but it isn't necessarily the, the determining force. It's, it's just one factor among many. Um, so uh, all of this is just a long way of saying that uh, for me, the shift to what came to be called digital humanities uh, was part of a long trajectory. Um, and within that enterprise, the notion of the public domain, the public impact, the social impact of the kind of knowledge that we produce within the walls of the university became a really central one. So early in the history of the humanities lab, I realized uh, that one of my jobs was to match make projects with public institutions and museums of course are, were an interesting institution because they have this kind of public facing aspect which a lot of research inside the university world inside the academy even in humanities fields doesn't have uh, and so a bunch of other pieces started adding themselves into the mix as we moved forward with the humanities lab founded in 1999 which took the form of partnerships, partnerships between work that happens inside the university with outside facing or public facing institutions. And to try to think about the design of new innovative kinds of research projects with that public facing dimension, with that matchmaking dimension to integrate those into a unified process was really, that became the kind of focal point for a lot of the work that, that we did. Um, so just to, come back to this question of, so this domain, this field of experimentation came to be called digital humanities. Um, and I don't really like either word in that title. So <laughs> even though I still use the label myself all the time, it's a very useful label. Uh, but the reason I don't like it very much is that the word digital, I think gives too much, uh, too much priority to the technologies as I was hinting at before, and not enough to the, in a sense, to the, the, the consequences that those technologies enable for us, which is a rethinking of what knowledge is of, and how it functions and how it circulates and uh, how it's produced uh, under current conditions. And particularly in domains like the humanities fields where uh, we have these, traditions, which are great traditions, but they're traditions that also create some limitations that we're trying, I think, all of us in our own different ways to overcome. Uh, the, the, the second word, humanities, I think is a little bit limiting because some of these areas of opportunity that open up once you start working with computational methods and once you start working with, uh, with a kind of toolkit that characterizes our era, they go beyond the humanities. They connect the humanities, the human sciences up to the natural sciences or to the social sciences. They connect 
up creative practice to critical and scholarly practice. And once you start to look at the world of knowledge from this, the standpoint of these through lines, uh, you, I don't think it matters so much whether you call yourself a humanist or you call yourself a social scientist. <laughs> when you're working on data, environmental data can be just as rich uh, a, a data set to work on as the collections data of a museum. Um, if once you, you understand what it means to dig into those kinds of resources, to try to transform them into uh, forms of research, to engage in them in critical and analytical processes, and then to transform the outcomes of those processes into storytelling or argument or experience, uh, those boundaries start to look really different. Um, so uh, I came over the course of, after a decade of experience at the humanities lab, now in the context of Meta Lab, to think of, to invent basically a domain, which I like to call knowledge design, simply because it puts the word design into, into the foreground. And it raises this broader question of what knowledge is and you know, how we produce it, how we convey it, how we, how we transmit it, teach it. Uh, and it puts those two words in a conversation, but no formula is perfect. Every formula is simply a kind of instigation, a, a way of framing, a way of, uh, of provoking a conversation. Um, and so uh, in the case of MetaLab, uh, our choice of uh, title, MetaLab, of course, is to sort of hint that we don't necessarily think of our, our core roots as being um, limited to the humanities domains, uh, although most of the people who are the core community members of MetaLab are, uh, certainly have deep roots in the arts and in the human sciences. Uh, uh, but rather we think of ourselves as a place of experimentation committed to three, uh, three kind of mantras, uh, which I, I spoke about a little bit in the last, um, the, the prior talk. One of them is this idea of this notion of being an idea foundry, of being about ideas. So ideas drive what we do, everything that we do. Um, so however much we might be technophiles, uh, we might be design geeks, we might be people who are committed to bringing creative and critical practice together, to bringing high level expert forms of scholarly inquiry and public facing knowledge creation together. Uh, it's about ideas. They, they, drive the, they drive the train, so to speak. They pull the train. The second was, is this notion of being a laboratory for knowledge design, whatever that means. In other words, a pace of experimentation, hands-on, linking the hands-on to the, the hand and the brain, if you like. Um, and uh, the third is production studio, delivering, making stuff, uh, deadlines, deliverables, stuff that goes beyond the, the normal academic type concepts of what a deliverable is. Uh, um, and uh, those three components, I think pretty aptly characterize the sort of mature version, at least of my own sense of vocation that was born with the humanities lab experience, which is this sense that uh, there's a need for platforms for experimentation. expect expertise and try to build on located knowledge, expert knowledge, bigger pictures. Um, and one, one of the ideas that came out of the humanities lab that I certainly carried forward with me to the human, to meta lab uh, is something that we at, uh, at the Stanford humanities lab, we called it big humanities. I, I don't know if this is a, no, a notion that has any currency today. It was a provocation when we came up with it because at the time there was a lot of debate about big science, you know, uh, you know, atom, you know, atomic accelerate, nuclear ac particle accelerators, the, the sort of science that required very long durations in terms of research 
you know, trajectories and large scale funding, which of course in the humanities is rare, if at all existent. But we came up with this phrase, big humanities as a provocation, simply to say, let's think big. Like instead of working like monks in our cells, let's create communities, a laboratory as a community and try to build these structures where significant numbers of people with different areas of expertise work together towards high impact, high visibility, high risk outcomes. Uh, and in the process of doing so, uh, we train and we teach students through a pedagogy. And this is crucial to the laboratory, uh, whether it was the Stanford Humanities Lab or Meta Lab, uh, we train students through practice. Uh, we, we, uh, we teach them by letting them be part of teams that are structured teams where they perform a small piece of a larger work process, just like in a natural science laboratory. And they learn by being part of those conversations across disciplines, across domains of expertise. Um, and uh, they learn what teamwork is, what collaboration is. They learn the skills of translating across disciplinary domains. And that model of pedagogy has been extremely valuable, I think, to uh, in all of these different phases of my own, um, uh, my own trajectory. And it's certainly a key component of what we do at MetaLab, um, uh, teaching student participation, student engagement, is uh, really the backbone of the research infrastructure, if you like. And one of, there are various ways of achieving that. One of them is to have classes, courses that are integrated into research projects where a research project lives outside of the classroom, but it expresses itself at different moments in its history as a classroom experience, where students produce a piece of a larger research project and maybe after the course has run its course, they go on to become part of the research team beyond the classroom. This is often how it works at, it worked at Stanford and it works at Harvard. Uh, another component is students working as team members and doing independent research, essentially independent course credits within project, within research projects. Uh, and there are, there's a third model, which is a more volunteer based model where students just get interested in projects. Sometimes students generate projects at MetaLab. They come to us with a project idea and we're able to be catalysts and support a project that uh, is student initiated. So uh, the notion of creating this kind of lab platform where there's a porous boundary between the classroom and the project, the research project, but with some autonomy between the two but also a fluid boundary between the community that is a university and the space of research experimentation that is a lab and experimentation that is the lab that has an entrepreneurial component where ideas that are good ideas that within the lab can be incubated and then supported and But in the cultural sphere, of course, it can mean working matchmaking with institutions, building projects across those institutions, uh, building a uh, connection to different kinds of civic entities. Um, and it's that expansive notion of the entrepreneurial that I think is appropriate to a sort of laboratory model like the Stanford Humanities Lab or, or, the, the, or the, the, the Meta Lab. Uh, I'll just close by saying um, in the case of Piaggio Fast Forward, which is the, the company that I was the co-founder of. Uh, so Piaggio Fast Forward was uh, uh, really born actually directly out of uh, contact between the leadership of a, an 135 year old company, the Piaggio Group and MetaLab, believe it or not. So a humanities lab, so to speak. Uh, we hold open, lab events every now and then where we invite friends from the media lab at MIT. We have a kind of 
it's like a cross between a party and a hackathon projects presented in progress it's like a showcase project sometimes with some live performance events it's a way of sharing our work with a bigger community than the harvard or mit community and people show up we never know who's going to show up sometimes a lot of people show up sometimes from the business school and they come the Harvard Business School. They, they come, you know, they're curious about the work that's happening. Um, and one of those sh uh, showcase events led to a conversation between me and a couple of senior executives from the Piaggio Group. Uh, and when they discovered that I work between Italy and the United States, I'm a former motorcycle racer, I know a lot about, you know, about uh, uh, engineering, even though I'm not an engineer. Uh, they sort of started getting interested because they had been thinking about a think tank on the future of mobility. Um, and eventually a couple of years passed, they approached me uh, to ask if I might be interested in helping them to create a think tank about the future of light mobility. Uh, they're famous throughout the world for Vespa scooters, for Moto Guzzi motorcycles, Aprilia motorcycles. But of course, motorcycles and scooters are a, uh, a, a transportation form that has more than a century of, uh, of history behind it right now. And the question they were asking, which is an, a, the kind of question the automobile is, industry is asking today is what are the mobility forms of the 21st century? Like what's, what's gonna happen in light mobility? The average age of a person who buys a motorcycle today is uh, 65 years old. Uh, uh, scooters are growing as a market only in Southeast Asia because of the demographics of Asia. Uh, so what does a new mobility vector look like that taps into the tech emergent technologies of the past 20 years that has connectivity as a feature that uh, is uh, uh, capable of using all kinds of sensing technologies. Like those were the kinds of questions that they were asking themselves. And they were looking for people to be part of that conversation who were not coming from the automobile industry or the motorcycle or the light mobility industry. They were looking for people who could think outside of the box. And so, um, Piaggio Fast Forward is a good example of how uh, even in the strictly entrepreneurial commercial business world, the kinds of challenges that uh, are constantly being faced often require forms of thinking that step outside of those contexts, but that are deeply embedded in the technological, cultural, and social environment that we all inhabit as part of our emerging everyday world. And, um, and in the case of this particular conversation, the think tank in question that they were wanted to set up got set up. It lasted for one weekend. And there were so many good ideas that the leadership of this 135-year-old multinational company decided that running a think tank was a waste of time. Let's, we should start a company. And here, the people in the room are the right people to lead that company. And so I was the CEO of this company for the first three years. It's a robotics company fo focused on creating uh, vehicles that support pedestrian mobility choices using the techniques, the technologies that are used in self-driving cars. But we're the anti-self-driving car company because we, our vision at the core, it was not just my vision, the vision of my co-founder, Greg Lynn, who's an architect, was of walkable cities, not cities that continue the narrative of development that we inherited from the 20th century where automobiles have been the protagonists of the urban landscape, but rather our vision, which is rooted in a conviction that is shared by urban planners and certainly in the last 30 plus years, the emphasis on reducing automobile access to center cities has been a top priority for uh, in urban development. Our notion was let's create the support structure for those walkable cities that are becoming increasingly central to models of contemporary urban planning. In our case, in the form of vehicles that support walking as an activity. So instead of replacing human mobility, our focus was on supporting human mobility by creating robotic vehicles that follow people who are actually doing the walking, not riding, not riding, not, not, not uh, being passengers, but rather 
walking, expressing this profound sense of autonomy that walking represents, this integ that's integral to human identity. So uh, our motto at Piaggio Fast Forward is autonomy for humans. It's, the, it's a provocation, of course, because of the whole conversation around autonomy and technology has been uh, giving machines autonomy to take over from human functions. Our focus is to use those same technologies associated with autonomy to support human activity. So all of that is a long way of saying that the human sciences, the humanities have a lot to bring to all of these key arguments that have to do with the present and the future of our cities, our culture, our society, but we have to position ourselves appropriately to be at those crossroads, to intervene in those conversations in ways that are informed by technology, by all of the, uh, you know, what engineering, other kinds of forms of knowledge bring to the table, powerfully bring to the table. And, um, and I think maybe that's the challenge that I think that humanities laboratories of different kinds face is to find that crossroads position that allows us to, to be there uh, at the table, designing databases, building databases, knowing how to uh, have a conversation with an engineer uh, when it comes to thinking about a sensing system and what it should do or what it shouldn't do. Uh, some of those questions are profoundly social, philosophical, ethical questions, but we can't just be the critics and the ethicists who stand outside and say, no. <laughs> we also have to, have to pronounce a yes in the form of concrete propositions, projects, ideas that drive those processes in well-informed ways that are rooted in the traditions of these disciplines, but that go beyond the conventional confines of those disciplines. So I'm, I'm gonna stop there. I, I hope I wasn't rambling too much, but this was an attempt to just give you a kind of, maybe an overall like 10,000 foot sketch of the path that's carried me on into what might appear like these very disjunct areas, but but in fact they're very closely interconnected areas. Oh, that was that was great, Jeffrey. Thank you so much. Um, I, in your last lecture two weeks ago, which I was uh, delighted to attend, you also mentioned the word laboratory. So I'm glad you picked up on that again this time, because in the context two weeks ago, you said, well, you use the term laboratory because you could kind of sneak it in, you know. <laughs> You're an empty. And so I, I wanted to ask you about setting up the Meta Lab in Harvard and how it's mm -hmm. formed and how do you interact with the kind of main kind of power bases in Harvard uh, and the teaching facilities and the different uh, faculties. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's that's it's a it's a really important question and it's it's one that um uh, that we, I think not only I struggled with, but I think almost anybody who's trying to create a kind of space platform for experimentation struggles with uh, whatever the university setting. So, so MetaLab is, is a really interesting case. I've tried not to repeat the errors that I made at Stanford. <laughs> um, and I could talk about those as well, if you're interested, Marie. Um, but um, so MetaLab is part of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. And I was very lucky because when I came to Harvard, the Berkman Klein Center already existed. <laughs> Not only did it exist, but it was this thriving community, really fantastic community. Uh, as some of you may know, it, uh, it played a central role in a number of important domains having to do with the internet as a public and civic space. Uh, Creative Commons, for example, was first elaborated uh, within the Berkman Klein Center. Uh, a number of really important initiatives having to do with not just intellectual property, but security, the notions of a whole set of key legal notions associated with uh, the internet as a public space. Uh, from net neutrality to some of the basic uh, underpinnings of the uh, legal structures that 
uh, oversee the governance of the internet were all shaped by the founders of uh, the Berkman Klein Center. Um, uh, Larry Lessig uh, was among them. Um, and, uh, and so I had the good fortune at Harvard when I first came to Harvard and I was trying to set up Metal Lab and I was discussing with different parties where it would be located uh, to be already part of the Berkman uh, Center. And, um, and the minute I set foot in the Berkman Center, I knew that it was the right institutional home. Um, um, but that didn't make everybody happy because uh, the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, which is the, you know, the School of Arts and Sciences at Harvard, which is where my appointment is, they certainly thought that if I, a, humani a member of the humanities faculty is creating this laboratory structure, they should own it. You know, they, after all, they were gonna have to put some seed money in to get it started and so forth. So there were a lot of debates about where should it be located? Should it be connected to the School of Arts and Sciences? Should it be connected to another school? Maybe the School of Design? Should it be connected uh, the Berkman Klein Center, by the way, was founded in the Harvard Law School. It wasn't even part of the university. It was part of the law school. And only in 2009, when I first came to Harvard, had it moved outside of the law school and to become a university-wide center. So um, there were a lot of debates about this question. I mean, my uh, the, the solution we came to is that MetaLab is part of the Berkman Klein Center, which is a university-wide center. So what does university-wide center mean? It means a center, a research center that is not limited to one school or another. It's not connected to the law school. It's not connected to the arts, School of Arts and Sciences, not to the business school, not to the engineering school, not to the medical school. It lives, it kind of floats above the structure of schools. And uh, I, if I can give any advice, useful advice uh, would uh, certainly, I, I would certainly promote the notion that if you really wanna be a platform for experimentation that brings together, that steps outside of the conventional taxonomy of disciplines, that that's a very good place to be. In other words, to not be connected to a single unit within the university. Uh, and, so that's, that's how, uh, in the case of MetaLab, I solved the problem is I, I insisted, I fought, it took a year to convince everybody that MetaLab should not be part of the School of Arts and Sciences, even though it was very much associated with the, the, the arts and humanities. Um, uh, I didn't want it to be limited by the contours of the school. Um, and one, um, if I could add one key point there is that um, I had a very bad experience at Stanford. This was with the, 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 the bad news part of the story. Trying to, after five years of the Stanford Humanities Lab, where I reported directly to the president and the provost, where the Humanities Lab existed outside of any faculty or school. Like most universities, Stanford wants to normalize a structure, once it's, it's had its experimental phase, they want quite appropriately, administrations want it to report more, not directly to the top of the university, but rather to report to, to a structure that's more closely connected to it. So the lab was moved into the School of, uh, the, uh, of Humanities and Sciences at Stanford. Um, and from the minute that that move happened, the humanities lab ran into trouble at Stanford. Uh, it was competing with departments for resources. It was stepping on the toes of other structures. When it had conversations with the School of Engineering, let me give, give you a concrete example. We set up a, um, we set up a, uh, a, a, a um, uh, what do we call it? Um, it was a, a, a program uh, much like the Media Lab at MIT does with private companies where we would work with them, a collaborative, a kind of consulting relationship where we invited, to, we created corporate partnerships essentially so that companies could fund
of design automobiles for the aging population. Uh, Sorry, Jeffrey, really that was, uh, sorry, there was an interruption. I, I, I'm afraid we missed the, the central part of your argument. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to turn off a device here because it might be some competing bandwidth. Uh, yeah, uh, we, so we set up a kind of corporate partnership program at the time that the Humanities Lab moved into the School of Arts and Sciences at Stanford to the, the School of Humanities and Sciences, uh, where we, we, we performed a couple of projects with companies that would contract with us to think about really interesting questions. Uh, in the case of the Herman Miller uh, Furniture Company, uh, the, the office space of the future, sort of um, uh, reimagining office furniture for emergent technologies and new modes of working. You know, a very futuristic kind of project. In the case of Daimler Chrysler, we did a project on reimagining cars and instrument panels for the aging population. Uh, and we would bring our team of anthropologists, designers, historians together to tackle these problems. Uh, but a lot of people in my own colleagues thought this was terrible. This was exactly what we shouldn't be doing. <laughs> um, you know, and even at MIT, the Media Lab has been highly controversial because of the degree to which it's closely connected often to the corporate sponsorships that it obtains. So um, I guess what I was trying to say with regard to this issue of where do you position a, a, an enterprise like this that's willing to experiment with models that are not popular among even your colleagues, uh, you need to be protected. You need to have autonomy you, 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 as much as you can. Um, and being outside of the structure of departments and schools and faculties uh, gives you a lot of freedom. It also has one price that you pay, which is uh, that you're a very fragile construct. So you have to bring your own funding in. You have to find a way to support yourself because you're not part of the political system that will allocate resources. So uh, that's a long-winded way of saying that um, I'm very interested in impure kind of experimental models that even bring industry and uh, pure research, academic-based research in the humanities fields together. Um, but to give yourself that freedom that you need to step outside of the faculty structure um, you need uh, to also be very entrepreneurial about how you support yourself because it's very, it's it's extremely challenging. Um, so, so yeah, just one last point. Um, so, how can you have it both ways? I'm always asking this question. Uh, in the case of MetaLab, I mentioned teaching as an important part of what we do, mm. not only including students in projects by engaging them as participants, active players in projects, but also the classroom experience. Um, you can do both. So you can be an independent laboratory and connect, build institutional alliances with departments, with, uh, uh, with schools that will allow you to be present in the classroom, intersect with academic programs, which is often where resources are allocated and decided, and at the same time, maintain a separate identity. So finding a way institutionally to combine those two things, I think is a really interesting, it's a challenging proposition, but I think it could be in the long run, the most interesting one for centers that are trying to build a, a profile like the one I was describing. Great. Um, obviously, obviously, I agree with you completely. Once you step outside of the, the normal budget allocations and you become autonomous, then your funding sources uh, become, I suppose, questionable. And, and I think if you have to take in commercial investment, you have to be very careful about that. We've seen, we've seen some, um, the Media Lab make some very serious mistakes there. And um, so I'll step away from this now because uh, there's a lot of other people who would like to ask questions. So, um, who, who, Franz, would you like to go next? Or, um, there's uh, well, yeah, so uh, there are so many uh, issues here in the room. You know, um, 
and we planned this conversation also collecting uh, long lists of questions and I have many questions and I'm afraid the deed is done in our case we are <laughs> Center. We have digital humanities in our uh, title. We are part of the Department of Humanities, uh, <laughs> and we are very much part of the, the st uh, structure. So we have to struggle and to maybe, uh, um, but that's maybe good to know. So to to find this freedom that you uh, found from from the other way around. So we we are stable in a way because my position is funded, that I don't have to justify uh, everything. <laughs> But of course, uh, we have to uh, find a mixed way of um, uh, funding our stuff because uh, the department has uh, limited resources. And I mean, that's also the idea when we have been funded that we will generate a lot of money and uh, prestige. So uh, I hope. <laughs> so, but uh, just to, the, the laboratory, so, so we, we are a center and we want to establish uh, laboratories as well. Uh, but I think we have a different idea. So we have to uh, revise our ideas of what's actually a laboratory. Uh, so our, our, uh, at the moment, we are using this term to create a, a room, space, and time for students because we are responsible for a study program. And this is very much in the initial experimental stage. And uh, uh, teaching and education is only a part of your mission in the laboratory. So you, the laboratory is the whole thing, whereas in our uh, architecture, the laboratory is a part of our educational program. And of course, we want to connect this to, to our research projects and to, to uh, create new idea and also to, to develop knowledge. So that will be a challenge to bring these pieces together. And if you have uh, very concrete advice, what is uh, what are requirements? So, I mean, in terms of space and time of people, I mean, I'm... I'm not so, I mean, you are a very special uh, person who is obviously able to create this space and uh, room to uh, have to design knowledge and to get in contact with, with other entities. So, I mean, it's, it's also a very personal thing. I, I, I'm, I'm afraid, so, I, I can't, so we can't just copy what you are doing. So we need to find who we are and what, what we can do. But, uh, apart from this, what would you say? What are the basics? So to to create this this room and to make make meaningful teaching and learning uh, and exchange possible. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question, and and um, and I think one point I would make, Franz, specifically related to this institutional location question, is that I don't think there's a right answer to this question because every institution is different. You know this as well as I. Um, so we all have to work with our locations in a sense to answer the question of what's doable. And also, I think this is pertinent to your uh, this question of, um, you know, the demographics, the composition of the teams and so forth. Um, so, um, and I guess my inclination um, in answering your this this last question and it's something that I've learned from experience also, you know, in Bono and in Malo, uh, uh, certainly at Stanford, is that often the really best place to start is really to double down on the local. In other words, with local questions, local problems, to start with those as a focal point. Um, it, it, by, by that, what I mean is uh, to ask your research questions not in a kind of ideal universe where there's um, maybe, um, you know, the, the kinds of questions that one might think about as an individual scholar, but rather to look at um, whether it's a set of opportunities that are connected to the location that you find yourself in, you know, a partnership with a museum that has problem collections, right? Like uh, there's a concrete example. Like I love problem collections because they usually have research questions connected to them. Uh, and to treat those problem solving exercises as the way to generate from the bottom up, so to speak, um, a portfolio of engagements, uh, training opportunities, educational opportunities. So in a city like Venice, I don't need to tell this to say this to this group, there's an infinity of these kinds of problems. I mean, there's so such a richesse of archives museum collections, institutions, 
uh, that are fragile constructs that can only do so much under their in their current operating environment. But if you can build a research project that's also a training project, an educational project, maybe with outputs that are public facing outputs, uh, that's just a fantastic convergence of forces. That's one kind of example. Another kind of example, which is very relevant to MetaLab, what we do is we're also interested in institutional problems. So let me give you a concrete example. Um, uh, the way in the United States, as many of you know, uh, the way that students choose the courses that they the courses that they study uh, at the undergraduate level, sort of corso di laurea uh, level, uh, they have a lot of optional uh, courses. Uh, they have a, a lot of freedom, especially in the early years of their studies. Uh, but the way the university represents its course offerings, it used to be a book. It was a catalog. Uh, sometime around 1990, the university, of course, like universities, like all large scale entities throughout the world, transitioned from print to databases. So now what do students do? They go on a web page, they look at an inventory, basically, a listing of courses, and they have to make decisions about, you know. Uh, what courses to look into, what courses to enroll in, and so forth. Uh, and in the process of moving from a catalog, from a printed book, basically, to a database, a lot of information was stripped away. And students are increasingly completely, uh, uh, I would say, disoriented, especially students in their first year, their second year, when they're just like learning about the incredible range of things you can do at a place, you know, like Harvard, you know, from studying Assyro-Babylonian inscriptions to, you know, <laughs> biotech to, um, and the catalog does very little for them. And so at a certain point, uh, in a conversation with the Dean of, uh, of the humanities, uh, the idea came up of like, what if uh, the university, commissioned MetaLab to sketch out, develop a prototype for an alternative system that would use the uh, use data visualization and data analytics and a whole series of other tools to tell a much richer story about what courses are and how they interconnect between uh, one to the other and how fields are not just these little boxes, not just these little consumer choices. Like I choose X, you know, if you like X, you might like Y. We don't even have that in our course catalog. <laughs> you just choose a course, that's it. Uh, so uh, we built a platform, literally, we built a software platform. I can actually show you the platform if you wanna get a sense of it. But this is a concrete example. This was a, a three-year project. It was very complicated. Um, we, uh, I can tell you more about it if you're if you're interested. But uh, let me just show it to you just as an example because I think it's it's kind of interesting. Um, and uh, so here it is. It's uh, this is can, uh, is my screen sharing. Can everybody see it? Yeah. Are we good. Yeah. Okay. So this this is a platform called Curricle, uh, and. As you can see at the top of the menu is the notion of exploration. So instead of students shopping for courses, sort of making consumer choices, our idea was let's use a much richer set of uh, data sets to, to connect courses, to treat courses as part of a unified world of knowledge instead of as this list of individual choices that you can make. So an example. Uh, keyword comparisons, instead of a single keyword search, what if we could take a series of terms like, for example, here you're seeing a diagram. These are, by the way, all the courses that are listed at Harvard in the current semester that just completed uh, the fall semester. So let's look at weather. Um, I'm gonna have to move my bar here whether in relation to, uh, I don't know, what would be good um, history. 
And what we're doing here is just generating on the basis of the data available in the registrar's database, the points where those two terms crisscross through the bibliographies, the course descriptions, the course names, the faculty interests. So let's say we're interested in sociology. I can double click on sociology, get into the sociology of organizations, culture, history, and society. I can keep on clicking down all the way to a course. And here we are in this uh, course. And what Curricle allows you to do is to add that to your schedule. So I just click down through using a data visualization to get myself. So this is just one of a number of modes, but let's say, let's just adopt a different perspective here. And that is what I'm looking for as a student is not an experience so much of the way weather interconnects with, the his, with history, but rather I want a one-on-one -on -one experience or I want a seminar. I don't wanna be in a lecture class. I don't wanna be in a laboratory. I wanna be on this kind of scale of a learning experience. So here you can see the same data set is being represented from the standpoint of different scales of learning. In this case, a seminar, where are seminars available? Or where is a tutorial available to me? And again, I go into classics or I can go into all the way down to an individual tutorial, which I can add to my schedule. So this is a, this is a practical tool. It's a scheduling uh, a tool, if you like. It's a course planning tool, but it's a, a tool that allows these different ways into, uh, let's say I'm interested in the relationship. Like I took a class with a particular faculty member and uh, I particularly like them, but I want to know who they hang out with. Like, who are their peers? This is my friend, my colleague, Peter Gallison. Like, who does Peter teach with? Whose bibliographies and courses is he on? And here you see a kind of social network of the faculty members who are, uh, uh, in a sense, engaged in a common enterprise, but it's not an enterprise where students see the lines that connect them up. And one last view, let's see, let's say I'm just kind of curious about what is Harvard University? Uh, here's a map that you notice that the two areas where we have a highlighted domain are ones that where courses are offered that I just put in my, I put in my tray on my schedule. Uh, so sociology and classics, but let's say I'm just interested in the universe of physics as it's taught at Harvard. So here is, physics at Harvard this semester. Each of these is a course. Uh, I can go back and go around and explore different fields. Uh, this is just an example of where an institutional problem, which is how do we communicate what we do, the most pure expression of which is the teaching that we do as a community of learning in new and fresh and interactive ways that enhance the the experience of students who have to navigate this universe. And by the way, at the bottom of the menu, you see something called curricle lens, and that's a research wing. That's a place where we do research projects that are database narratives on different stories, like the, the his, teaching of the history of the book at Harvard or the teaching of hip hop at Harvard using data visualization storytelling techniques. Uh, uh, where each of these events is an event in the history of the Harvard curriculum, going back to when the shift happened to data to database uh, registration in 1990 to uh, to the present. Um, so uh, I just give that as an example because institutional problem solving can be an extremely interesting way of building a research group around something that you can get funding behind, that you can get people involved in, that you can get buy-in from lots of different parties that might otherwise not believe in your vision. Um, uh, and so at Harvard, MetaLab has become now well known as a place you can go to and get um, creative, but, but also expert input into you know, data visualization, for example. So people come to us sometimes with these really interesting problems, but you can 
also go out and seek them out. Uh, those are both uh, opportunities. So, so starting local, I think, is really a, a strong way to, to make sure that you can sustain these kinds of efforts. That looks like a fantastic tool, Jeffrey. Um, but you have such a range of courses in Harvard. I mean, one of the things about Europe is that we are state funded. All the universities are state funded. Yep. And in, in the US, it's a different model. But, um, you know, we can still do a lot with state funding. But that's, that's, that's so impressive. So um, we, I asked for questions before the lecture started. So um, I would like to pass over if anybody else would like to ask a question. But uh, there was a student who, uh, Fabiola, who asked a question. And uh, she was asking about how to put a project together. And a, another common thread is how to put together a multidisciplinary team. So maybe mm. share your thoughts on that. Yeah, both important questions. So um, at the Stanford Humanities Lab, we had an application process. So we had funding that we would seed funding that we would give to projects that were just ideas. And ideas were welcome. And, and by the way, this, uh, I should mention, this was a little controversial. Some faculty got bent out of shape about this. We made no distinction between students, undergraduate, graduate, postdocs, faculty, staff, administrators, curators in the University Museum. We welcomed applications from all of the above and we evaluated them critically and we offered a small amount of funding to develop those seed ideas into a project idea. So that was our process there. Um, and that worked really well. Um, it, it made a lot of enemies, but it worked really well because some great projects developed, but you know, people who are privileged at the top of the pyramid, you know, pr professors don't like to be told that their projects are being canceled after the seeding route. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, you're, you're going to step on people's toes and you're going to break rules of hierarchy, no matter how you, uh, you, you approach these decisions. But that, that was the model that we used at, at the Stanford Humanities Lab. And then after that seeding process, once a project reached a certain sort of initial scale, it was evaluated and the projects that were, we believed we, we were ready to commit to, to help to the next stage, uh, we would put our, you know, institutional muscle and try to get more resources for. So, so there was a kind of testing phase and then projects became projects within the humanities lab. Uh, one other thing we did, which was very unpopular, it violated a lot of rules, uh, particularly within uh, a very genteel environment like uh, American research universities, was that the core team the leadership team at the humanities lab, and this is true at MetaLab as well, uh, we get involved in every project. We don't let people develop their own projects and then just present them to us. Uh, the idea is it's a community. It's almost like a collective. And so we try to bring our expertise and our knowledge about how to design projects, how to build projects, technology skills, design skills, whatever it is, media skills, creative skills into the design of the project right from the beginning. So even when we accepted seed projects, we would brainstorm and critique and revise those projects with the creators of the projects. So our process from the beginning was very hands-on. Uh, we don't just try to support projects, we try to incubate them in every sense of the word, really to give them a shape that we think is going to work. And, and some people respond and think that's a wonderful experience and other people find that intrusive to their academic freedom or, you know, whatever. Uh, at, at the Meta Lab, the structure is a little bit more informal. So we don't actually have a seating process. We, uh, but we have an open door policy. And so we have a weekly staff meeting, which people are welcome to join. Sometimes we have people from all over the world who just come as visitors and students from within Harvard who just say, I have an idea, I wanna to come to a meeting. Uh, they come to the meeting, they hear the conversation that's happening within the lab among the core team. It's a 
pretty small core team. We're set up like a design studio. So uh, we have what are called principles. Uh, uh, there are four, actually five principles, sort of, they're like the senior partners in the lab. I'm one of the five principles. The others are uh, somebody who's a, a very, a very prominent writer and thinker on environmental issues, but principally a writer and blogger, not a technologist, but somebody with very broad transdisciplinary interests. Uh, another is a creative artist who works with questions of moral philosophy, but in the form of an art practice. Another is a creative technologist. That's what we call our technologists. Uh, I think you probably would like this, Marie, right? You, you're somebody with who's a you know computer scientist, but who you know is interested in forms of creative and critical practice of that skill set, um, and. Um, those principles are really involved in every project. Like we, uh, and, and I'm sorry, the last one is a, uh, a, a very brilliant data visualization um, practitioner who has skills as a programmer, but is principally an artist. Uh, so uh, that's kind of like the smallest group that around which is a much bigger community with very loose contours. Uh, people who are involved in a, specific project who just get interested, friends and fellow travelers from MIT and other universities, uh, from Northeastern in particular, we have very close connections. Um, and uh, a lot of that bigger community connects to one project or another project, but not all projects. Uh, so it's like a series of Venn, Venn diagrams, you might say, with overlaps between these, these gradual different circles. Um, and students are uh, welcomed into the community. Uh, some of them come through courses that they've taken with that are connected to MetaLab. Others just hear about MetaLab and they're interested. Others are students who are involved in data projects, for example, and they're looking for a home and they need expert help um in their projects others are art projects that are born that bubble up from the student population and typically in a very informal way we decide to adopt projects where we think we can help the students to realize them uh, one of those projects is this project on loneliness and the pandemic i don't know if any of you saw that online it's it the idea was to write the world's longest letter where it's a collective letter where on a web platform that was we helped to, to design, to co contributed to, but much of the work was done by Harvard undergraduates. Uh, it's a site of aggregation of letters talking about what it's like to live through a pandemic. And, uh, uh, but of course, like the AIDS quilt in the case of the, um, AIDS movement, the idea is to build this collective time capsule like artifact that's shared, that builds community, that re, in a sense, works against the very thing that's documented, which is this phenomenon of isolation induced by the pandemic through the web site. But then what is expected is that there will be an art installation that comes out at the end that's an actual physical site uh, and maybe a publication as well. The world's longest letter that turns into one of the world's longest books. I don't know what, what the expression will be. So that's a, a good example because that was a project where a group of Harvard students came to us and said, uh, we're trying to do this thing and we don't really know how to do it and we don't have design skills. Maybe you can help incubate this for us. And we thought it was a wonderful idea and we just facilitated. In other cases, projects uh, come from the principals, the principal group who lead, uh, lead the lab. Uh, and that's often the case. One of us has an idea or a partnership we've developed and we, tr we just try to get funding around it. We try to build a support structure for it and um, we let it run its life cycle. Uh, one thing that's important to this question is we're very entrepreneurial. We don't assume that the way we construct our projects is the right way and that funding should come and find us. Uh, we, we go after resources wherever they are. <laughs> um, and uh, if that means learning a new skill and, and 
having to use data sets that are not in our fields of research, we don't care. Uh, we, we try to be very uh, opportunistic about uh, the opportunities that come our way. Um, so uh, in, in short, in, in answer to this question, it's, a, it's complicated. <laughs> it's complicated. It's not a simple structure. Projects come from many different places and um, that's worked well for us. The one price that we pay is this fragility that we're always living a little bit dangerously in terms of how we support ourselves. And every couple of years, we struggle with this issue of like, oh, we don't have a big enough project to support the people we need to support. How do we, how do we sustain that effort? Uh, and the university gives us very little. It's just enough money to, it's kind of a seed fund that keeps us alive. Uh, we're, we squat, our physical location is a kind of, you know, squat that the School of Design has allowed, has, has tolerated for, for almost nine years now. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a fragile existence, I guess, um, is what I'd underscore. But having that fragility and having to look for different funding sources uh, for projects you want to work on is very healthy, actually. Because if you were sitting there and you were comfy and cozy and the money was just coming, you don't have that same edginess. You're not willing to take those risks. So, I mean, exactly. I can understand that it probably, there are some days when you feel, I wish I didn't have to spend so much time looking for funding, but it's a, it's a good relationship to have that, you know, with the funding. So um, maybe, is there anybody who would like to ask a question? Yeah, maybe we can play a little bit of ping pong, Mary. So I, I'm watching... <laughs> And you, uh, you are watching our list of really interesting questions uh, that are raised by our um, team colleagues and the students. So uh, from the chat, the first uh, uh, candidate would be Dino Bozzetti, who I'm very happy to welcome here in, in, this, uh, in this round. So Dino, if you want to uh, activate your mic microphone and ask a question, you are very welcome if you are still there. Uh, oh, yes, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I shall be very brief, uh, uh, and, uh, 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 and this forces me to be provocative. <laughs> I am uh, myself, uh, as well as uh, uh, Professor Schnapp, uh, a medievalist. I, I had uh, a, a different... Uh, uh, because I, I didn't uh, begin as a medievalist, but me, they put me to, to do this job, and then... <laughs> <laughs> so the academic... <laughs> anyway, uh, one thing, just one thing. In those years, in the 80s, I noticed that uh, the medievalists were the most advanced uh, in uh, understanding the opportunities of uh, digital uh, means. Uh, there was a, a, a journal uh, or, or a bulletin at the uh, Institut for l'Histoire et la Recherche de Text uh, in Paris, and it was called uh, the, uh, uh, Le Medieviste l'Ordinateur, there in the 80s. So uh, I, I don't think that uh, the medievalists uh, are like uh, a monk in a cell, because, <laughs> and uh, I. Uh, uh, I, I thought of it uh, as a, a great opportunity because, for instance, we started uh, with the project of uh, uh, producing uh, editions of uh, uh, text of manuscript uh, tradition uh, in the teaching of logic in Bologna. And we wanted to use computers because we thought uh, we, we can do it easily. But then I discovered the fun of it was the fact that uh, whereas before I gave the notion of texts as granted, text is text. Now, in trying to do things for representing the text, I discovered that I am not at the end of, of, of understanding what the text is. So this is the, the, the challenging of uh, uh, doing digital humanities for me or as it was called, humanities computing. I know that Jeffrey doesn't like <laughs> this denomination. <laughs> oh, but the, provocative, the provocative question, I have just here something which uh, Jerome McGann 
wrote uh, in a, a, a journal online for humanities and uh, he uh, writes uh, just a sentence. Uh, uh, Jeffrey, uh, I, noticed, I noted it, that sometimes tradition is a limitation. And uh, uh, in, on one side, uh, for the medieval monks, but also for the university model, the Humboldt University model of 19th century Germany. I don't think that uh, that's a limitation because when I grew up, in my high school, I had, uh, when I, 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 I gave the finals for my high school, we had uh, uh, Italian literature, Latin, uh, Greek, uh, history, philosophy, physics, maths, and uh, uh, history of art and so on. So this is very different from the Anglo-Saxon si system, which is very specialized. So we had already, the idea of putting things together. So uh, I think that your reaction was a reaction mm -hmm. to the narrowness of the specialization of the uh, educational uh, curriculum uh, in the Anglo-Saxon world. Whereas, uh, 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 for instance, uh, in, in Italy, it was the other way around as far as uh, a secondary school. So, uh, uh, no, I, I'm just uh, reading the uh, quotation from McGann. Uh, well, uh, there, there is a divide between humanists, between those who want to do digital humanities and mm -hmm. the traditionalists. But for the new ones, he says, the profound importance of our traditional resources is much less well understood. So, so I think <laughs> this statement is at odds with the, the idea of tradition as a limitation, which was proposed by, by, by Jeffrey. So that was my, and uh, uh, I, I mean, I, 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 I think that the wonderful uh, work you are doing is mo mostly focused on the production of knowledge. Not, for instance, McGann in the same uh, uh, thing, he quotes uh, uh, August Böch at the beginning of 19th century, the definition of philology, the erkenntnis mm -hmm. of the erkanten, the uh, knowledge of what is and has been known. So uh, I think uh, in a recent interview <laughs> in Italy, I remember reading that you said, oh, well, philology is a 19th century thing. We have to go <laughs> beyond that. <laughs> well, uh, uh, that's my, 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 my point. Uh, I understand humanities uh, uh, research as a kind of meta research, Erkenntnis des Erkanten, the, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this aspect is less uh, cared of in your approach. Mm -hmm. Well, um, first of all, I, I very much share, um, I, I don't think actually we disagree uh, as much as you were suggesting in the way you posed the question, because um, I, you're absolutely right that I was, my own reaction was to the particular environment in which I found myself, uh, in, um, which is the North American environment where, particular, where a particular model construction of the university uh, took hold and uh, continues to, to, to shape fields of, of inquiry. Um, and uh, I remember when I was, I was writing a book on a uh, a visionary engineer of the 1930s, Gaetano Choka, looking at the curriculum because in his archive, there were copies of his student records from studying at the Politecnico di Torino, looking at the courses that he had taken. And it looked like the, a kind of curriculum, uh, a, a revolutionary curriculum compared to today where you know there was so much integration across disciplines in the way that engineers were trained back in his generation. So absolutely, different institutional traditions play different, uh, create different contexts, opportunities as well as challenges. And um, the, the point you made, uh, which is one I should have made earlier, but I welcome uh, the provocation, the instigation to make it, 
is that interestingly enough in digital humanities work or in computational humanities work as it was referred to before digital humanities became a, a way of describing this domain, uh, you're absolutely right. Medievalists and classicists, archeologists in particular, uh, played a pioneering role in, most, in many of these fields. I mean, going all the way back to Roberto Buza, who you might say was the first, you know, proto-digital humanist, uh, who was a Thomistic scholar, uh, uh, working with IBM, IBM mainframe computing uh, computers, uh, and I think there's a reason for that. Uh, and I, I'm far from a, um, a, a, a critic of traditions, and certainly not medieval ones. I, I tried to hint that the scriptorium, the kind of richness, intellectual richness of the scriptorium as a model for the laboratory of the humanities today is, is a significant provocation that forces us to take seriously some of the most powerful and transformative aspects of medieval culture. For me, philology is where I come from. Uh, and so I, I have tremendous uh, uh, respect, especially for philology in its golden era, which I see really as late 19th century and certain moments in the 20th century. What I have worried about with regard to philologically based me methods is that is that they uh, sometimes have maintained a stranglehold over different domains of cultural inquiry. And so I think they needed to be enriched by the kind of stimulus that comes from other domains as, as, as well. But I do think that um, different traditions of disciplinarity are more or less open to, uh, to the opportunities and the challenges that we have today and it's not an either or proposition it's not an out out it's it's really a question of finding out where those locations are those domains are where we have special opportunities and I'll, I'll give a concrete example i'm sure this will be dear to your heart manuscript studies so who would have thought that manuscript studies studies of codices of you know medieval manuscripts would be hugely benefited by digitalization. Like those of us who are old enough to remember what it was like to do paleographic work before, you know, back in the 1980s will be the first to testify to how difficult that work is. The need to travel to a location to work intensively with this physical artifact. And now manuscript studies are booming thanks not just to access through digitization, but also new techniques that are emerging where we can work with corpora that are vastly expanded. So for me, the historical fields are a particular area of opportunity precisely as new technologies and platforms emerge that expand our horizons of research. Um, and the other thing about those platforms and those horizons is that suddenly corpora, which were locked up in storage or a very difficult access are suddenly in public, publicly viewable places. And that also creates that other opening, which is towards thinking about how we engage not in, you know, haute divulgation, you know, not just in dissemination, but also how we bring expert knowledge into public view. And for me, that's really one of the most exciting dimensions of the digital humanities as they have taken shape is, is not how we water down expert knowledge, but how we make expert knowledge. And this is, was the focus of what I said in my earlier talk, um, how we make that expert knowledge visi viewable, visitable, mm -hmm. ac accessible also in, in the sense of we translated into forms that um, an audience of non-experts could be engaged by. Um, and we, as humanists, we have one really, really strong card that we can always play, which we don't play enough, uh, which is the charismatic power of the cultural objects that we work on. That charismatic power is uh, really our trump card. You're so right, Jeffrey. <laughs> Thank you. And I have a question from Federico Tanazi. So are you there, Federico? Yes, I'm here. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much. I, I feel like a 
I've learned so many things in just one hour and a half talk. I'm like reacted to so many stimuli. And I, I must say, I prepared like, like a huge list of questions and now I have to like to, to cherry pick them. <laughs> uh, the, the thing that like was really striking for me when I was reading like your, your career is that you started as a medievist and you started as like a researcher or philology and we, we were talking precisely about philology and that was really something that that like was striking for me because I, I am a currently a PhD student in the field of classics I am a philologist and I have that kind of academic background uh, so when I was looking at your like path and your career after like studying philology uh, I was really amazed because it really like strikes me how you can like move and cross and transcend boundaries from uh, one field of research to another. And the question uh, around this topic is uh, what could be a word of advice for someone like you nowadays who is like uh, getting in contact with this kind of word in this field. Uh, I think there are students from the Digital Humanities uh, master course you, in this conversation. I am uh, myself a PhD student in this field. So what are the opportunities? And I have another question, so you can maybe put them together in, in your answer. Uh, during your presentation, you, you put your accents on uh, your emphasis on uh, collaboration, like working together with people and also the, the opportunity you got to, uh, to build the, the joint venture with Piaggio uh, was something like a, a Kairos, the perfect moment, meeting the people, talking with them, uh, that led to, to, to the birth of this project. How mm -hmm. can you uh, envision uh, this kind of uh, projects of uh, like, life and career paths in the pandemic world and in the post-pandemic world. How did MetaLab react to, to the new situation and how this paradigm will uh, influence your work in the future? And still again, thank you very, very much. Yeah, no, thanks Federico. Those are, those are both great, uh, great questions. Um, yeah, I, I mean, my, my personal inclination in responding to your first question, which is a really important question, because I think there are, there are two tendencies within that are always fighting each other within the university world. One is to especially to, to embrace the, the advent of a new kind of disciplinary model, which digital humanities certainly uh, embodies um, as an opportunity to promote a vision of a kind of new literacy. So like, there's one strand within the digital humanities community that tends to think of, yes, instead of three foreign languages or you know, one ancient language and two modern languages, let's have computational skills or programming skills as the, you know, the other language. Uh, in other words, to somehow imagine that we're moving in I think to imagine correctly to a certain degree that we've moved into a new framing of what the essential skill set is for being an advanced practitioner. And I think there's a lot of merit to that view, but it isn't, that's not my view. <laughs> um, my view uh, is instead that uh, I think there's a lot of value in combining uh, drilling deep into a traditional disciplinary domain, a domain of expertise, but having another leg, your other legs outside that domain. It's what I like to call disciplinarity under pressure. <laughs> uh, so uh, the idea is, or at least my idea is that there's value in creating friction between being a really good classical philologist and somebody who is sitting around a table constructing a project with maybe a designer, a software engineer, three historians who are thinking about different aspects of the data you're working on, a geographer. You know, in other words, that I think there's a place for the two of those models to coexist. And I think that it's the clash, but also the coalescence between those, those two that is the, in my experience, the most productive. 
my worry about the first model is even though it's it's right, it's not wrong, is that it it you lose a little bit of that kind of edge of connection to sometimes those domains of super specialization where insights happen. Of course, if you just stay in those domains, you also lose that kind of broader set of horizons, that ability to see the bigger picture where that piece of knowledge fits into. So my, I guess my advice in response to the first question is to encourage students to go deep in at least one discipline, but to make sure that they're constantly pulled out in, <clears throat> and, and into those other much bigger horizon conversations so that they move back and forth between those two, those two dimensions, uh, uh, especially at the graduate level. I think there's a lot of value in that. So I'm, even though I, I ultimately, I believe in transdisciplinarity, I worry in the transdisciplinary model that we lose some of that kind of grasp of local forms of knowledge that disciplines are often the custodians of. Um, and so on the question of opportunity, I mean, that's a really important question. Um, and uh, it brings up a kind of cultural issue, which I, I think was implicit, but maybe not explicit in a lot of what I've said. What, that I'll make it much more explicit. And that is that um, our, a kind of traditional understanding of how we train, how we professionalize, we've become scholars, practitioners in a field, expert practitioners. Uh, tends to lead us to think that we stay on our ground, we occupy that ground. And, and that's, as I said at the beginning of my narrative, uh, of, it can be a very lonely ground. You could be talking to very few people who are that deep into a domain of expertise. And there's a lot of value there, but of course there's also a risk. And that risk is that what you think is a decisive piece of the larger puzzle of knowledge to the world may be meaningful only to you and those three or 10 or 20 other people. Uh, and when you have to go and justify it to the taxpayers who are paying your salary or to the uni university or the institution you're part of, you may find yourself on standing on rather weak ground, even though you think it's precious ground. So um, uh, what that has led me to conclude, especially through these experiences of building projects across the university that link together the extra university with the intra university worlds is uh, that we need to be more entrepreneurial and opportunistic in how we approach those occasions where something, a door opens, an accident happens, a collision takes place. Instead of retreating to our expert ground, I think sometimes we are invited to step forward and do something that we don't know how to do. And I like to say in my classroom, especially when I teach courses that are connected to MetaLab, that my job is not to be the teacher, but to be the number one learner <laughs> in the classroom. And that same attitude is shared by some of my colleagues. It's a difficult attitude if you're used to being the authority figure. Uh, you still have the authority. You're not giving up your authority or your expertise. It's just that you're doing something that you are not trained to do, that where you're having to learn. I will never be a, a coder or a programmer who's anywhere as good as some of the people I work with. And the same goes for data visualization. But at least to have gotten close to that world, to have done a little bit of it, to have gotten my hands dirty, to know, know what it is that happens under the hood allows me to suddenly step in to a conversation when an opportunity presents itself and to see what the possibilities are, to, to be that entrepreneur who's thinking, you know, I don't do environmental history, but here's a data set, here's a funding opportunity, here are some interesting people to work with. Let's take that opportunity, not step back. And so that's, that's the kind of the, the non-risk aversiveness that is such a hard thing to institute in an academic environment where there's a lot of, I think particularly in the humanities fields, a lot of aversiveness to risk. Um, but I think it's essential because if we wanna have an impact in the world, we have to take chances and we have to step outside of practices that are the ones that 
we've been rewarded for or that we were being supported to pursue. Um, and that's hard, you know, it's just objectively hard. So, you know, I gave you the example of uh, uh, Piaggio Fassford, which is a really unusual case. Um, I mean, the humanities lab at Stanford spun off three startups. So we never excluded that we might create, you know, give rise to ideas and projects and even technology that could, could have a life outside the university. They all failed <laughs> quickly, <laughs> usually within six months. Um, were they interesting technology? They were super interesting technology. But be, having super interesting technology and having a successful startup are two completely different things. Uh, Piaggio Fast Forward, it was born as a think tank. Uh, I helped them to set up the think tank. I got the right people together. And the next thing you knew, we were running a company. Uh, you never know where any of these paths are gonna lead. And that's what's exciting, but also what's of course terrifying about moving into uh, an entrepreneurial space. But I think in the arts and humanities right today, we have the opportunity to be catalysts in this way. And I think it's we need to seize these opportunities because we can't plan for them. They don't come our way by planning. We have to go out and create them. We have to take chances. We have to step outside of our comfort zone. And we have to be willing to accept uh, negative outcomes as a positive outcome. And um, that's, I think, culturally a really big challenge in the university today, especially in the arts and humanities disciplines, much less so in the technical disciplines. People in the engineering world, by the way, they're not, uh, I think Marie can just can vouch for me on this. Uh, they, there's a whole tradition of thinking about failed research or failed experiments as successful outcomes that you then write up and you, you, you analyze. And, um, why is that? I think it has to do with more funding being out there, people feeling more secure. Uh, yeah. I totally agree with you. Um, I think the technical people have, you know, gotten loads of funding and uh, they, they can fail, you know, because there's more funding coming down the line. And certainly, you know, the college, I'm, I'm in Dublin, I'm in Trinity College, and um, the small amount of measly funding that comes through for arts and humanities <laughs> And if they get the smallest amount, they're overjoyed. Whereas as technologists, <laughs> not worth it. Now I'm, 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 I'm very conscious that we're coming to the end. And I have one more question from uh, Carolina Fernandez Castrillo, who's in Madrid. And um, I hope she's there. I think she is. I am. Um, thank you, Mary. Um, thank you so much, Professor Schnapp. It's uh, amazing having this opportunity of knowing more about your work. I find you are really, really inspiring. For me, it's something that it's like a present knowing, knowing that you have this meta lab at Harvard. And I hope we will find ways of collaboration from, from Venice. Um, I was also impressed about uh, your interest in avant-garde because I, I am expert in futurism and for me it was such an inspiring movement in order to understand how the digital world works. So it was something that for me was like a funny thing I found from your profile. And I, I would like just to, to ask you one question because I think that probably you are very tired after almost two hours. Uh, from the avant-garde, I find that there are so many points um, of reference to, to, to take um, in order to understand our present and how it's going to be the future. I think, think that at the beginning of the 20th century, the situation was uh, very special because of the new means of communication, transportation. So it was a sort of stressing uh, period of time and also very creative. And from the avant-garde, I, I really got this idea of the active role of the um, audience and how these artists try to provocate the audience in order to, to have, uh, well, the, the, the beginnings of, of the idea of the user, like part of the process, not just the receiver. And currently I am working on, on the idea of intercreativity and, and public engagement. Um, at the Venice Center for Digital and Public Humanities. And from your last seminar, I, I found very interesting what you were mentioning related 
to the citizen science projects. I find that um, probably from Harvard, you are developing uh, new research areas related to, well, new fields of, of trying to engage the audience, but also the citizens from digital innovation, from arts, for, from humanities. And I would like to know if you have currently some projects and if you are working on, on maybe interesting ideas on this. And also if it will be possible maybe to establish like a sort of collaboration with you because we find that Venice is like an epicenter for this green recovery. After the pandemic, uh, well, there is a lot to do and maybe thinking in green, it will be a good strategy and, and Venice probably is the, the best place to start it. And we probably have, um, we will need some help from experts in order to develop strategies to engage the citizens. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to understand if you are developing this research line and, and um, what do you think about the possibilities for the future? Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you, uh, Carolina. Um, yeah, a couple of points. I mean, one thing you, you mentioned is collaboration and I think uh, the opportunity and the pandemic has maybe driven this home with particularly with particular acuity. Uh, however much we might be tired of Zoom, you know, video conferences and uh, this model of assembly, which we're practicing at this very instant, uh, the opportunity for really thinking about research questions, not in terms of large scale collaborative teamwork, you know, these kind of models of projects that we're seeing increasingly emphasized in European EU funding, uh, which are great, I think, you know, centers of excellence and so forth, but also thinking about them as opportunities to build multi-university or multi-party partnerships, I think is, is really a great opportunity uh, for, for the humanities in particular, where we suffer a lot from isolation. So I really believe in a kind of, it sounds like a contradiction, but a doubling down on local location on connecting the place to our institutions, to the places we are, the collections, the problems we're surrounded by. But at the same time, the opportunity for linking through telepresence, through online collaboration is a great one. And bringing those two together, I think is an exceptional, represents an exceptional opportunity. Uh, I will confess that when I was starting the Stanford Humanities Lab, I spent a lot of time thinking about this issue, not just of labels, but institutional models. And I mentioned, we talked about whether we would be a center, whether we would be a department, whether we would be a committee, a, a research group. We settled on laboratory um, for the reasons I mentioned. In my head was the medieval scriptorium, but probably more prominently in my head was the laboratory of the avant-garde. Sort of my fantasy was to create, you know, a kind of equivalent, 1990s equivalent of, you know, Black Mountain College, the Bauhaus, the laboratory of constructivism, certainly futurism, which is the avant-garde I've worked on the most extensively. Uh, I think the idea of uh, a structure that, is cross-disciplinary, that is trying to somehow reinvigorate a whole corpus of ideas, principles, ideas, but place them in dialogue with uh, all kinds of human needs, uh, emerging cultural exigencies and so forth. All of that seemed to map on to aspects of uh, certainly the adventure of the avant-garde. Uh, so it's not a completely, uh, accidental <laughs> uh, choice by by any means, um, um, and uh, you know. It, but uh, to to come back to this question of uh, areas of opportunity, I do think that uh, that I think partnerships are really an important part of this longer term transformation that the universities are undergoing um, in the, particularly the arts and humanities fields, we tend still to be very much rooted in our local institutional practices. And I do think there are exceptional opportunities. I was just talking uh, earlier today in a call with the Dean about uh, uh, a project uh, that we're just beginning to think about, which involves 
working with Harvard's manuscript collections and, and rare print collections where there are these very, very large corpora of books that belonged, volumes that belonged to important people or, or that were transmitted to, through their history over the course of hundreds of years, read by different people who left streams of annotation uh, in the margins of these books or interlinear uh, uh, annotations. And of course, the history of those kinds of books, which are characteristic of rare book libraries throughout the world, is often an incredibly interesting piece of reception history. Like from a cultural historian standpoint, it's super interesting. What's the problem? The problem is typically somebody has to go and create a, an edition essentially of those works. And there's extremely interesting technology on the one hand being developed to read handwriting. Uh, there are some projects in Italy going on at this time, for example, at the AI lab in Modena, uh, reading handwriting from different periods, manuscript decoding via machine learning, but also, of course, these manuscripts and these, these volumes are extremely interesting. And there's a lot of interest in non-experts in participating in uh, transcription projects. The Jeremy Bentham project is one of the most famous one where Bentham left behind this very large corpus of finely written notebooks, but no scholar at this point could dedicate his or her entire career to simply producing editions of Bentham's notebooks it wouldn't pay off professionally. So what did the Bentham Scholar community create? They created an online platform where it's not like there are thousands or tens of thousands of people who, who sit down every morning with their coffee and decide to transcribe a paragraph from Jeremy Bentham. Uh, apparently it's about some 30 to 100 mostly elderly people who are find this extremely rewarding to be involved in this sort of transcription project. Um, and so I think there are just so many different opportunities for creating modes of engagement. What I think the successful lessons show us is that you have to design those points of engagement with great care. You can't ask a citizen scholar to solve a big puzzle. You need to break up those puzzles into bite-sized chunks, tasks that are well adapted to the particular level of engagement that you can expect from a citizen scientist or a citizen scholar. Um, and if you go to Zoom, Zoomiverse, I don't know if you've looked at the collection of projects that they've gathered together under a single umbrella. There are some fantastic citizen science projects some of them involve observational skills in the natural world. Some of them involve uh, astronomy, as I mentioned in the talk. That's a field where there's a lot of amateur, passionate amateur interest. Um, in the case of the humanities and the cultural fields, uh, we've seen some interesting projects with museum collections, like uh, human tagging of large museum collections, for example. AI services do a pretty bad job. Uh, or a, a pretty approximate job, I would say, of tagging, um, you know, Renaissance paintings, <laughs> recognizing objects, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, when you create a project like this, I think you have to think especially about a kind of hierarchical model of how the knowledge is produced. In other words, what's a task that works at this kind of bite-sized chunk level that an ordinary person would find interesting, that they would be absorbed by, it wouldn't be too overwhelming and where they'd, they'd have a high level of satisfaction to participate. What's the next level of interpretation? What do we do with the, the work that's produced at that scale? And then what do we do with that? And at each of those levels, there's a different amount, different levels of expertise, different levels of engagement and commitment that are, I think, implicit. Um, so it's not a simple task, but I think it's a doable task particularly when we're working with the kinds of collections that are characteristic of fields uh, in the human sciences. I, for me, archeology span is the field that's been the most exciting to observe. Uh, I think classical archeologists have done some of the most interesting stuff around uh, the, in this domain. Um, I mentioned, I think the Ancient Lives uh, project, which is an exemplary project now mostly complete if I'm not mistaken. 
but I think that there are a lot of other potential projects out there where we could get students, school kids involved in uh, processing materials that otherwise are going to sit in storage in uh, museums and libraries and archives. Um, so, so yes, uh, absolutely. It's, it's, I think, a domain uh, where there's a lot of potential. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Well, I, I think we're out of time. And uh, Jeffrey, I just want to say that was a totally inspirational talk. And I've learned so much from you. And uh, you are an in total inspiration to anyone working in this in this field. And um, I hope that sometime soon in the new world, you will come to Venice and we can learn more from you. So thank you so much. Well, with great pleasure. I look forward to that occasion. And thanks well, everybody for, for, for uh, my part. So um, yeah, I hope we can, we could continue this conversation over the next weeks, but uh, of course <laughs> that will <laughs> not be feasible. But thanks anyway. So I want <laughs> every word that has been said from Mary and and, the, and I'm sorry for the many uh, other participants who had questions. I don't know you. We can share the the, the chat with you. The, the trans. <laughs> yeah. We must many, many share. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You. So I, I hope to meet you sometime in person. Yeah, same. Such Take care, pleasure. everybody. Such a pleasure. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Bye bye.